have an excellent group of people up here. We got some fascinating talks. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Dr. Lin, who is the founder of Ask Dr. Lin, medical director of Eden here in Florida, and emergency med medicine physician at HCA University Hospital. Dr. Lin. Good morning, good morning. Okay, I know we're all getting back from lunch. Everyone's a little tired, but hopefully we've warmed up some and we are ready for our afternoon session of day two of our conference. So I'm Dr. Safia Lynn Lasseter. I am an emergency medicine physician and I also have a cannabis practice located in Aventura, Florida. So I'm here from South Florida today, happy to be here. This is actually my second time presenting at this conference. I presented the very first year in 2017 um, and that's when I launched my practice and I've attended each year after that. So it's nice to be back behind the podium and sharing some of my experience and my journey with all of you. Um, just a heads up, I am the new medical director of Eden Florida LLC, which is one of the brand new licenses that was awarded on December 28th in uh, Florida. It's a part of the Black Pigford license. So we are very fresh in the industry and new to this role. So I'm no longer practicing and prescribing for patients, but I did spend the last seven years prescribing for patients. So I have a wealth of knowledge and experience and I've seen this program unfold in Florida over the last seven years and that's been amazing. Transitioning into this new space has been exciting, learning about the manufacturing and the production and cultivation of cannabis. So I get to really explore from seed to sale and understand the importance and value of that. Um, in addition to that, I am also part of the Board of Directors, which is a volunteer position unpaid for Association for Cannabis Health Equity and Health Medicine. All right, let's get into it. Why are we even having this discussion? What's the title? In the Weeds, Managing Cannabis-Related Emergencies in Medical Practice. I know you have been seeing all of these headlines over the last couple of years. Some of them have been crazy, right? Legal marijuana grows, more children have been sickened by edibles, we're seeing them in the ED, we're seeing headlines of patients overdosing at um, after school care, we're also seeing ER visits for kids who've ingested cannabis, you've seen videos online, some of the things that we never thought we would have to anticipate in our generation. But it's happening, so what are we gonna do? Address it, prepare ourselves so we know how to acknowledge what's going on, identify it, and treat it appropriately. Just to check the temperature in the room, how many are practicing physicians right now, currently? Amazing, and all of you are practicing cannabis? And how many, there you go, and how many want to practice and are kind of very new in the business and here to learn for the weekend? All right, so we got some more people coming in just so we know who we're dealing with. My background is ER, so that is the perspective we're gonna speak from. As more states shift to legalize cannabis, and with that urgency, they're pushing, they're pushing, they're expediting. There's been an increase in medical harms witnessed in the emergency department, and I've seen them firsthand. Patients are increasingly seeking medical alternatives and adjunct therapy for cannabis for symptomatic relief of things like chronic pain, managing anxiety, increasing your appetite, and overall mental wellness, which we all need a little bit. Most patient adverse reactions are seen in children and the elderly. We're gonna speak about some of the pediatric reactions that we've seen in the ER today. Critically important for our medical professionals and patients to understand the potency of cannabis products for safe and responsible consumption. Proper education for all of us is necessary to avoid unnecessary ED visits and evaluations. My goal for this entire presentation is to provide a comprehensive overview of the most common cannabis cases seen in the ED. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Florida Poison Control Center, understand the top six things that we are seeing in emergency department as physicians when patients come in related to cannabis. We're also gonna talk about some strategies that we can do prior to coming to the ER. And we're gonna recognize um, Federal Health and Human Services, whether they've been proactive or reactive in terms of all these new legislative changes and how they are informing our community. So we know where we're at today. This map looked very different five years ago. Every year it's improving and improving. We have over 38 states that are medical and we also have a great handful of states that are recreational as well. Florida Poison Control Center. Who's ever called the Poison Control Center? What's the number? Don't. 
It's so easy to remember that so many people forget it. 1-800-222-1222. Super easy. As a parent, you should know that. As a, as a physician, you should definitely know that. I use them all the time. So they're definitely um, on my speed dial for sure, because it's not just for cannabis. It's for anything that you ingest or a bug bite or any kind of toxin that you're unfamiliar with. You can call them for advice for anything. They're a great resource. The problem is when we're calling them as either worried family members, as physicians, as patients, they don't know if you're ingesting Delta-8 or if you're ingesting Delta-9, what type of THC it is. So they can't distinguish between, did this person take medical cannabis? This is, did this person take an edible that's off the street? They really don't know. So they're clumping all of their phone calls as THC-related cases or cannabis-related cases. There were over 1,100 documented calls regarding marijuana exposure. And they really break it down on the Florida Poison Control site, whether it's edible exposure, dry flower exposure, tincture exposure. But in total, overall, for cannabis in general, they had about 1,100 calls in 2023. Some of the side effects that we see when a patient presents to us after a cannabis ingestion that's either been misused or overuse are things like anxiety, panic, fear, tachycardia, hypertension. We also see some hallucinations. Anyone had a bad trip and hallucinated before? Okay, there we go, some honest hands, <laughs> me too. That's why we're having this conversation, right? Some hallucinations, some sedation. You can even get as far as seizures. These are all possible risks. Now, these are no different than any risk from any other medication you're taking, right? Whether that's antibiotics, whether that's sedatives, that's benzos, that's narcotics, whatever that is. Anything you take that's medicine has side effects. So I'm putting this out there not as a disclaimer to say this is the only thing that you see with cannabis, but to say, hey, medication has risk. It's important that we understand the risk, and that way we can explain that to our patients when we're recommending cannabis for them. Rapid cannabis detection in the ER is done two ways, either with urine or blood. Urine comes back the fastest in the ER, so therefore, typically, a urine drug screen is performed in the ED. Also, more states legalize cannabis for medical and adult use. There's going to be an increase in availability, right? With THC being more potent now than ever, Consequently, there's a higher risk for misuse, leading to an influx of emergency department visits. So as we get more accessibility for cannabis, we have a responsibility to educate our community more, so that way they don't misuse it and end up in the ER, because it's never a nice visit when they come to the ER. This is a screenshot of the Florida Poison Control Center, and it just shows you the breakdown by county to shows you where the most popular drug screen, um, drugs of abuse are. And it really has a very nice up-to-date interactive map. If you ever go on their website, you'll be able to put in your county, you'll be able to put in and see exactly how many calls were done for that county for that year. It's a super interactive um, slide that's been awesome. Just to give you some heads up when I was doing my research in preparation for today. Edible cases, there were about 322 cases, which is almost a 30% increase in phone call this year compared to last year. So edibles have been high, high, high on the conversations for people who call the Florida Poison Control Center. They also talk about dry plant, and that's about 170 cases this year, which has decreased about 20%. And they also talk about e-cigarettes with THC, which is up 40% from last year compared to this year. So just to give you an idea, within the realm, they do a nice breakdown of what type of phone calls they're getting. What's really hard to calculate is that they get multiple calls because they want to do callbacks and, and all of those things. So it's very hard to get a precise number. But cannabis is a good portion of their phone calls for drug-related exposures that are um, seen at the Florida Poison Control Center. Let's see. Consumption with gummies, formulation is most likely to have the most serious effects in small children. Why is that? They taste good, I, absolutely. The flavor is really important. Kids are not gonna eat or drink anything that does not taste good, that doesn't have a sugary feel to it. So it tastes excellent. Give me another reason why kids are attracted to gummies. Color, and, and someone said it looks like candy, appearance-wise. If they see a bright red, a bright orange, a beautiful gummy looking appetizing thing that mimics candy that they've always wanted that their parents won't let them have, they're gonna grab it. When they see that opportunity to try it, they're gonna try it. It also has delayed effects. 
so slower absorption in the GI tract compared to other delivery methods which lead for a delayed response and therefore they're coming into the emergency department could be a few hours after ingestion. So we're not seeing the immediate hit. So sometimes parents don't even know that they ingested this, or caretakers, I should say. Overall, 22% increase in calls related to edibles across all age groups. And this is coming directly from the Poison Control Center. Let's talk a little bit about THC facts. So we know that the amount of THC consumed, the genetics, the frequency of use, body fat and metabolism all influence how your body um, reacts to THC. Managing patients is important to understand all of these limitations. So when you're getting ready to recommend marijuana, you have to understand, is this a naive patient or is this an extremely proficient patient who's been using for several years? You have to understand the quality of what they've been using previously might not be as potent as what you're getting ready to recommend. Thinking about the quality, thinking about how frequent they use it, think about their own personal absorption, co-ingestions with other medications or foods are relevant. These are all things that you have to do a very thorough history and physical exam for in order to be accurate on how you recommend. And I think the theme we've heard all weekend is start slow and start low, right? Low dosing, very slow consumption. So that way the person can identify what's best for them. Concentration is stronger than in previous years, and that's all due to genetic manipulation. We're not growing outside on the fields anymore and, and bringing it in and, and chopping it up and seeing what happens. We're now growing in very controlled environments. And with that, we're able to manipulate the plants so that way we can crossbreed and find the best composition. Dosing guidelines for medical cannabis average about 30 milligrams THC per day or less in combination with CBD. Each method consumption has its own bioavailability. What does that mean? If I, if I take a, a hit of a joint versus rubbing a topical, do you think they all have the same effect at the same time? No. Why is that? There we go, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, absolutely. So we're talking about absorption process. Absorption through the skin or transdermal versus sublingual under the tongue versus um, inhalation all versus submucosal, like doing something rectally, all have different onset of action. You have to think about the modality when you're recommending for patients. Is it safe consumption for them to use? Can they use multiple different types of consumption at the same time? That way you can achieve maximum relief of your medications. It's okay to put your topicals on four, five, six times a day. That's okay. That's going on your rheumatoid arthritis, on your joints, on your chronic knee pain, on your chronic back pain. In addition to taking your edibles, you can use a quick hit for immediate relief of inhalation and have your edibles for long-term relief so they'll get you some relief overnight. So think about all of those things when you're recommending to layer your products to achieve maximum benefit. The most common forms of ingestion that we're seeing are inhalation and oral, which would be uh, edibles. The length of the high depends on the consumption, individual biology, as physicians, the plateau peaks for inhaled products in about 30 minutes and subsides in average three hours. And granted, these are very average numbers. In ingestion, you might see the effects within one hour, and that effect is um, measured by what you recently ate. If you're taking this on a full stomach versus an empty stomach, some people even have gastric sleeves and modifications of their stomach, so their absorption is different. You have to consider prior surgeries. This will typically plateau in about three hours and subside within four to 12 hours. We talked a little bit about some of the side effects and symptoms when a patient presents to you. You might see them with tachycardia, hypertension, hypothermia, low, low temperatures, dry mouth, injected conjunctiva, or bright red eyes, or dry eyes. They might be a little slurred in their speech, motor delays. Their gait might be a little bit off or they might be as far as psychotic symptoms like euphoria, anxiety, confusion, hallucinations, and even fatigue. What's important to understand is that there is absolutely no one physical exam finding or lab or vital sign that can suggest the degree of level of impairment. So whether I took one hit of a joint versus I just smoked five joints in a row, there's no one particular vital sign that can tell me this person is super impaired or mildly impaired. 
So you can't gauge or measure it like that. So your clinical intuition, your experience are really key on what you're using to hone in on safety for this patient and what you're gonna do to make sure they maintain safety. Let's talk about some pre-hospital things. So a couple people raised their hand saying that they had bad trips before, right? Pre-hospital, the endocannabinoid system, which we learned about yesterday in the amazing conversations, they tend to um, downregulate to prevent super high experiences because they can achieve similar benefits using low THC. So that was the theme from yesterday's discussion. You don't have to go with super high potent doses. You can go with lower dosing of THC and achieve similar relief because we have this fantastic endocannabinoid system that works throughout the body. Lower dosing with broad spectrum products decreases the negative side effects. The only thing that really cures a bad trip is time. Time, 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 time. They have to sleep it off, they have to rest it off. Some things that you can do during that time to help influence and improve the trip is to provide low level stimulation. Decrease your lighting, decrease engagement with cell phones and um, computers and laptops so that way you're minimizing overstimulating the patient. You can also uh, recommend that in order to prevent negative trips, try to use minimal dosing with lower potencies and opt for a higher CBD strain when patients are using. Avoid co-ingestions. How many times do we see someone that's only used cannabis? Very, very, very rarely. Typically, they're using cannabis. They recently ingested, whether it's their prescribed or unprescribed medication. They've also probably taken some caffeine or even possibly some alcohol. So you have to think about how the metabolism is sped up for cannabis with these co-ingestions. Drink some water. Drink some water with lemon. Eat some pine nuts. Anybody heard of using peppercorns? Yep. And what do you do with that? Do you swallow it? Do you smoke it? What are you doing with the peppercorn? Under the tongue, you chew it. Chew it has great absorption sub, um, through the tongue and then under the tongue or even smelling it. So any type of way and all three together can have a maximal effect to improve the CBD high. I'm sorry, the THC high. Fresh fruit, peppercorns, we talked a little about pine nuts. And think about um, developing a safety plan. So after the patient comes down from their quote unquote high, they want to help talk to you about what is your safe plan? What if this happens again? How do you prevent that? And some of the things we talked about are having that in place, having a safe person as a contact, low stimulation, minimizing your dosing. But sometimes you make it all the way to the ER and you're like, I just cannot manage this at home. I need a little bit more help. So what do you do when you get to me, when you get to the emergency department? You recognize the patterns of cannabis use. That's the very first thing, you have to be astute. Most people aren't gonna tell you, so if you don't ask them directly, they are not gonna reveal it. Whether that's through fear, or whether they are, have been judged in previous settings for using cannabis, so many things surrounding that decision to inform or not inform their physicians that that's a part of their use. But you have to be gentle in your consideration and you have to ask direct questions. Most times I'll be like, do you smoke? The patient be like, no, nah, I don't smoke. Do you smoke weed? Yeah, 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 I smoke weed. Because they don't think about it as smoking. When I say, do you smoke, most people think I'm talking about nicotine, right? So you have to make sure that you're asking specific questions to pull the answers out of patient, because that's only going to help tailor your response the best way possible. Stabilize and assess the need for airway protection. ABCs, always, airway first, making sure they're not asphyxiating, making sure that they're not having potential com combined allergic reactions where you're having tongue swelling or oral airway swelling. Make sure that they're not vomiting and have the potential for aspiration. Assess airway. Some of the tests that we run, first thing you wanna do with anyone that's altered is an AccuCheck. Could this be glucose related? Could it be sugar related? Do a quick AccuCheck, takes you 10 seconds. CBC, CMP, alcohol levels are important. Urine, drug screen. EKGs for cardiac stability, aspirin, Tylenol levels. Check your PTINRs for your markers. Also check a CK. CK can measure for rhabdomyolysis. And think about possibly getting a head CT if you do not see improvement in the patient within six hours. Talk about co-ingestions. Assess other physical injuries, potential for self-harm or unstable psychiatric state. Now, and I'll, I'm totally, totally guilty of this myself. When a person comes in 
they're flailing and they're cursing you out and they're spitting on the staff, the first thing you're gonna do is put them in a psych room, right? So you want to prevent them from hurting their self, but most importantly, you wanna protect your staff as well because not, that's not the only patient they have for the night. They have 30 other patients in the ER. So what's important to understand is when you isolate somebody like that, you have to make sure you're addressing all of these other parameters that we talked about. You can't leave them in there for 30 minutes till they calm down. You have to make sure that they're safely monitored. One-to-one -one observation, getting direct history and physical exams to assess for any other signs of safety. They may be acting quote unquote crazy because they have a head injury or a bleed, right? So you have to think about all of those possible things that maybe you don't see on initial evaluation, but with more fine-tuned, careful care for the patient, you're able to get a little bit more. Short-term benzos, always possible. If they may need something like a little Ativan to help calm them down, to decrease delirium, decrease panic. Psychotherapy evaluation, and of course the goal for someone like this is you wanna help them get clean not just from cannabis, but you want to help them abstain for anything that is overstimulating them. So why are we here today? We're going to talk about ER, because that's my specialty. What are the top six things that I see in the emergency department? This is for an article, and I think it's been referenced um, a couple of times during our conference this weekend, but the top six things that we kind of see are acute intoxication or overdose, pediatric exposure, cannabis hyperemesis, which we had a great conversation about in our last session, cannabis use disorder withdrawal, um, EVALI, e-cigarettes or vaping associated lung injury, and synthetic cannabinoids. They label this as cannabis intoxication and overdose. I always like to use cannabis misuse as a proper term because as we all know, you can't die from cannabis. It has not been found on any death certificate that the sole cause for this person passing away is cannabis use. So it's not an overdose, but I consider it a misuse. So there's some language things that we still need to have clarification on, but us as the pioneers for what we're doing need to always steer the conversation in a positive light because we are using this as medication. A councilman from Dearborn, Michigan is outraged over a 911 call. He wants to know why no charges have been filed against a police officer who admits to confiscating marijuana from suspects and then baking it in brownies. And once he and his wife were full and high, they thought they'd overdosed and called 911. I think I'm having an overdose as so is my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if they had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Did you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just... I think we're dying. Okay, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know. We made brownies, and I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. <laughs> well, instead of being charged... Prilla. <laughs> Sorry. Instead of being charged, the police department let the officer resign. His wife was not charged either. So far, police officials have not commented on the case. <laughs> Even the news broadcaster who was presenting the story could not stop laughing because it's kind of ridiculous. As a cop, you, you steal the product from the patient, you go home, you use it, and you have a bad trip. Now, if that's not karma, I don't know what is, right? What is acute intoxication? Two or more of the following findings within two hours of ingestion, including euphoria, tachycardia, conjunctival injection, dry mouth, and increased appetite, with, uh, coupled with behavioral psychological changes. Smoking, you can see these side effects within minutes. Oral, you can see these side effects within hours. The resolution is typically four to six hours, and it's self-limiting, and you usually don't have to hospitalize these uh, patients. We want to turn now to an investigation underway at the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County, trying to figure out how Candy ended up sending several kids to the hospital. NBC6 brought to this story breaking news last night when you are with us, and we're working to learn the condition of those kids. Meantime, Lorena and Klein is live for us in Lauder Hill. So what have you been able to find out about what this substance was? Well, Shelly and Roxy, just between the last 15, 20 minutes, I did speak with a representative here at the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County, and they confirmed that the candy that was brought in was cannabis-infused gummies that was brought in by one of the kids involved and then shared with other kids. The children involved are between the ages of 6 to 8 years old, and I'm told here that the staff has been working to reach out to every single one of the families involved to get an update on the kids' condition. Now, take a look. Here's what 
what we know so far. Lauder Hill PD responded to the Boys and Girls Club on Northwest 19th Street Wednesday after a report that multiple children ate candy that was potentially mixed with an unknown substance. We now know what that substance is. Lauder Hill police came to this location three times yesterday and they told us that eight children ate the candy. Two of them were released on scene to their to their parents and then six others were taken to area hospitals. The Boys and Girls Club sent us So I think the main thing to take away in from interviews like this is the that the most common presentation of pediatric by contacting is lethargy. the local authorities Over and medical of personnel that are who responded coming quickly into the hospital to the after a facility. cannabis ingestion. We are continuing whether to it's monitor a gummy, the situation whether it's edible, whether and the status of um, all youth high involved. Being around now the spokesperson for the club tells me that they have been able to make contact with three So when you see a tired kid that's really, really abnormal. How often do your kids get tired? I know my, my kids go all day long. So a tired child either indicates some kind of illness and possibly consider your differential cannabis. Um, respiratory depression, seizures, hypotonia, and altered mental statuses are common. Length of stay averaging about 27 hours, up to about 18% admission to the ICU, the PICU. And um, the most common method is edibles. And we talked about some of the reasons why kids are even attracted to these edibles. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, we spent a good time on this earlier, so I'm not gonna, not gonna do it too much, but the key thing about it is the hot showers um, is really the, the, one of the main things that help patients understand the difference between someone who has just cyclic vomiting and cannabis hyperemesis. Cannabis hyperemesis has criteria. You can't just use it one time, take a hit, come in vomiting to the ER and want some IV fluids, and then you label them as cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, right? It has a duration of time that it has to be used for, so a chronic duration. Um, the frequency of the vomiting is important. We typically see it in male predominance, um, and coupled with some abdominal pain, typically less than 50 years old. But it, its chronicity is important because it's typically greater than a six month duration with severe cyclic vomiting for greater than three months. So you can't diagnose this on a one-time visit, on a one-time use. You, understanding the chronologically, how often this person's been using, how long they've been using for, how frequent they use, and has this been their reaction the majority of times when they use in order to pinpoint that diagnosis. It's thrown around all too easily in the emergency department that physicians don't even look up cannabis hyperemesis, but they prejudge the patient for having a positive drug screen or the patient reporting them that they did use cannabis and they're labeled then as cannabis hyperuse, which is inflating the amount of cases that we're seeing. Sometimes it's cyclic vomiting and not necessarily cannabis hyperemesis. So keep your threshold low, but understand the criteria. Cannabis use disorder, this one doesn't have any sound, but it's a great um, video from Headline. Healthline, and it talks about 12% prevalence of uh, cannabis use disorder after discontinuing chronic and heavy use. So over 10% of cannabis users nationwide have experienced cannabis use disorder after chronic and heavy use. That's the key here, chronic and heavy use. Require two symptoms. You're craving the weed. You're becoming tolerant. You need more dosing. You're using more than you intend. You're using despite it causing issues in your life. You're using in high risk situations and experiencing withdrawal and you're unable to quit. Some of the symptoms include anxiety, nervousness, which we've seen in almost 80% of the patients. You can even get hostile. You can experience insomnia, depression, mood changes and tremors. Typically begins one to three days post discontinuing your use. It peaks within one week and the duration it can be up to two weeks. Women more likely suffer than this compared to men and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you've gone through all the lab testing, you've gone through the cardiac workup, you've gone through the uh, psychological exam, you've done the CAT scans, and everything's come back negative. So as you peer more into the history, the history is key to understanding and diagnosing cannabis use disorder. E Valley, we saw a high, high um, research component to this over the last three years and improvement support. in removing because these products vacant, from the marketplace to minimize seeing this trauma. Hooked nicotine addicts. Sorry, the sound is a little low Jacob on this one. Caslow sees through the haze that has blinded some youth to the dangers Thank of you. vaping. This has really been pushed by big tobacco. They're the ones who own most of the big e-cigarette companies. And so this is just a way of finding a new target audience. 
Undoing decades of work, educating kids about the dangers of smoking, he says. These are devices that have 3 to 5% nicotine, whereas a traditional cigarette has 1% nicotine. Some people said, I actually tried cigarettes to get off of my e-cigarette because I was just so addicted. Caslow explains the habit became trendy for youth in 2019. It's bubblegum, it's mango. It, I mean, they switched their flavor from creme brulee to creme because young kids don't know what creme brulee is. Now he treats a steady stream of adolescents, the youngest just 12. These are kids coming in with cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, some fatigue, uh, a lot of nausea, so vomiting. So in the essence when of you time, the scans, I'm going to summarize. The most important see, thing is, is E-Valley is the chest right x-ray You want your lungs to be mostly air, as you'd imagine. Normal so you chest x-ray capacity black. on the left. And now you look just completely opaque. And then terrible chest ray, so x-ray capacity on the right, secondary to E-Valley use. These patients have these chest x-rays with no cough, no fever, no evidence of infection or pneumonia aspects, but the chest x-rays show that it interrupts normal lung function. The main culprit in these um, electronic cigarettes has been vitamin E acetate. Now that it's been identified and been removed from a lot of these um, over-the-counter electronic cigarettes, we're seeing a decline in this, but it's always something to keep in mind because illegal products enter the marketplace all the time. Synthetic cannabis, we know about this. It mimics the psychoactive effects of THC, and it carries a similar chemical structure, but it is not detectable in a typical urine drug screen. So synthetic cannabis is not THC positive on a urine drug screen. It varies so much, um, possessing a higher binding affinity for cannabinoid receptors, increasing the duration and psychoactive effects. What are some of the things we know it as? People have heard of K2. What else? Spice, what other names have we heard out there? Manjaro, Cloud9, there's all different kind of street names for it. So sometimes you gotta Google it yourself because I can't keep up with the name changes. But just know that you have to understand the street lingo to it because otherwise you won't be able to properly treat it. Sold online and in convenience stores, inexpensive. But the treatment for all of these things are supportive. What's the um, Federal Health and Human Services Department responsibility? We want to help regulate the market overall. I think that's the biggest responsibility. With the recent rescheduling of cannabis from Schedule 3 to Schedule 1, I'm sorry, from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, we are now at Schedule 3, um, this will affect the acceptance and integration of cannabis into the mainstream healthcare. Develop universal standards before cannabis enters the marketplace. We want to eliminate pesticides, contaminants, limit the THC um, quantity per serving package. So when we're talking about edibles, you don't want to have one edible with 20 milligrams and one with five milligrams, but make sure you're having some kind of universal packaging. Product design and child packaging resistant. Consider limiting um, taxes on regulated cannabis so that way consumers won't feel the need to go to the legacy market because I hear it all the time, Doc, I'm not going to the dispensary because if I use black market, it's cheaper. So if you limit some of the taxes on regulated cannabis, that is safer to use dispensary quality cannabis, maybe patients would be a little bit more inclined to do that instead of legacy. Let's wrap up right quick. So in summary, um, my name is Safia Lynn Lasseter. I hope you were able to take away a couple of things from this conversation, but the most important thing is keep your mind and your ears and your eyes open to listen to the patient, to receive the information, and be non-judgmental in the process. I think you'll get a lot further in your conversation and in understanding how to best manage the patient. I'll be available for questions afterward. I do not want to infringe on our next um, speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jamima Dujay. She's going to be talking about the legality of medical marijuana in the Sunshine State and talking about dosing considerations and other public health issues. Dr. Duje. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. I am Dr. Duje from the Poison Control Center. It's my pleasure to be here, and I just have to say thank you so much, Dr. Lister, for doing a shout out and a little overview of the Poison Control Center. So today's topic is just to kind of go over the safety. You're already taking care of your patients. You're making sure they're having the right dosage and stuff. But what else can go on? What can, what else can we talk about in terms of medical cannabis and in terms of safety? and go beyond not just your immediate patients, but think of the family as, as a whole uh, in terms of um, your patient care. 
So we'll go over the medical cannabis a little bit and we'll talk about the regulations, the dosage concerns, and then we'll talk about some safety measures. What else can we do? And we'll give you kind of a little overview of how to assess the poison control center. Or I could even say, uh, what can you do to help your patient know how to access the poison control center if they need that? So for medical cannabis in Florida, we all know where we at. Um, medical um, cannabis is legal, and you guys have been doing an amazing job taking care of patients and raising awareness of its use and value. We know in November there are, there are gonna be some changes as recreational is going on the ballot, so we still have to keep an eye to see how is that gonna affect your, your practice and your patients, being that there will be more um, products available legally in the market. So we still have to see how that unfolds. But also, we know that patients still need a qualified physician. So even with recreational use um, or adult use legalized, if that happened, that's not going to change the fact that they still need to see you. They still need to have certain things to follow through in the state. And no matter what they do, it's still going to be on you as you give a patient medical cannabis, as you give them a card and you give the prescription, it's still going to be your responsibility to make sure that those patients know those regulations and they are taking them as intended and they are following the rules. So we know there are some medical conditions that it's indicated for. So you guys have been going over that from cancer diagnosis to uh, post-traumatic stress disorders to some uh, other Parkinson or other movement disorders that patients are using it. So we don't see that changing. Maybe there will be more uh, qualifying conditions coming up as we become uh, more aware of its use and value. But at the federal level, we are seeing some changes happening from a schedule one. So it's illegal for people to cross the state line. It's illegal for people to use it in, in some federal um, buildings and so on. So they cannot take their Florida medical cannabis card and say, I'm just gonna get on a plane with my product and I'm good to go to California. Even if the states, both states have legal medical cannabis, they can, just cannot use it across state line. But that's changing because they're also considering to make it less of a federal offense um, by having that. So we still have to monitor to see what's happening. But those are the main um, things to keep in mind, that patients cannot share with others. We know in some culture, in some environment, people share medications, even though that's not what you intend your products to be, but patients do share medications. So you have to keep in mind to remind them when it comes to their medical cannabis, they cannot share that. They cannot be in their car because some people are thinking, okay, I can have a fake medical cannabis card and it's a get out of jail card. So if I get caught or pull over, even though I'm using this product, I can use it. No, that's not the state law. So you have to let them know they have to use it at home. They cannot go across the state line. They cannot share with others. They cannot be using it in their vehicle or other people or having a cannabis party like people um, tend to have. So um, one thing I didn't, um, uh, they still have to have their card no matter what or even if they're at home. So home use is the major takeaway for you to kind of remind your patients. Um, in Florida, that's the only place they can use it. So they cannot go across the border. They cannot bring it uh, in their luggage as they travel without having the proper documentation. So because they can use it in multiple ways, it can be inhaled. You've, you've heard that um, inhalation is, the, uh, is a uh, favorable way that people use it. But also we know sublingual use, we know edibles, and topical um, um, use is also um, other mode of, um, of use for, for medical cannabis. But with that, we have to keep in mind that those variations of use or availability can also cause some problems for our community. And you just heard that the edibles is something that's really favored by by patients, but also by their kids and their families. So those multiple substances, as you talk to your patients, they're gonna have their favorites. They're gonna have things that they wanna use or not use. You're not gonna stop them from doing that, but what can we really educate patients for, to know if you're gonna have edibles in your home, if you're gonna have the gummies, what can happen? What can we do to make it safer? And we heard about encouraging from um, some usage of some child resistant, but it's not child proof. Well, you might have a hard time opening it. I might have a hard time opening it. Give it to some three, four year old, they get it open for you. So we have to know it's not child proof. So inhalation, we know people love to smoke um, and vape it. Um, a lot of 
uh, young adults, not medical cannabis, but recreational, they are vaping them. So also know that if they have a parent who now have the legal product in the home, because they do have that substance use, they might more likely to use their parents as well. And also the disadvantage for that is we know that it's gonna have a short therapeutic effect. So patients might have to use it more frequently. And then again here, other people in the home with substance use or who favors smoking or inhaling might use those products as well. So disadvantage is that some public housing, if you have a patient with low socioeconomic, we live in public housing, what are you thinking about? How, what measure are you having in place? Where can they go to use their product because they cannot use it at home? A lot of those public housings don't, don't allow them to use it. So we have to look at it on a case by case basis. We cannot just give a patient a card, let them know to go about their way and get their, their substance, but they're not thinking, okay, are they gonna get in trouble for using it at home? So always talk to the patient, really understand their needs, and then maybe there might be some adjustment that can be made, even some policy changes, if that's the case that's needed. Edibles, again here, um, they are favored by um, most users, but they can also have a longer effect. They are delay onset of effects, and that's the caveat here. If we have a child that suggests some edibles, so the parents might think, okay, I'm just gonna watch for symptoms, but guess what? There will be delayed in onset of symptoms. So they have to be seen, they have to get the help, even before any onset of symptoms. So it's important for, for us to let patients know that there will be delay of onset. It can be up to an hour or two after consumption so a child might still look fine that lethargy might show up a little bit later so don't if it's eight o'clock at night don't let them go to sleep and thinking okay they don't have any symptoms they fine so we have to be mindful of that and then of course um, even though we say um, increased use of overdose so because it is test tasty it looks like things that people use every day and if you know a child that's gonna eat one gummy just let me know they're not gonna eat one they're gonna eat multiple and we teach our children to share. So if they have siblings, if they have cousins, they're going to share with their, their, their siblings and their cousins, and that's why you have them bringing it to school and share with their friends. So what are some risk and safety concerns? So we must really balance, do kind of balancing act to see where we are. If the patient need it, the patient need it. So you're going to give them their medical cannabis. So what can we we think about. We have to consider, for example, pregnancy and breastfeeding. There are still a lot of gray areas there. Um, really remind your patients that it, it, we're still learning uh, about this. We're still doing more research. It's going to be needed. And because it's a, it's a substance, one, I mean, substance one, like at the, le at the federal level, we cannot study it really, but we still need more openings to be able to study and get more information. So I would always tell patients to be mindful if they are breastfeeding, if they are pregnant. And also, some patients with past medical history of psychotic disorders. So uh, we, there have been cases where it worsened those, um, those pre-existing conditions. Um, so it might be a new onset too, because the patient might have a, pa a family history, and that might be what triggers it. So always th talk about that. And also some uh, memory and, and cognitive impairment. So if you have a patient with some dementia, in addition to other medical conditions who are using that, they might notice that I'm having more memory problem or or if your older adults have other type of memory decline, it could be kind of a compounding effect there. So also uh, some cardiac effects, some pulmonary effects. So really look at the patient as an individual and see what's happening. And sometimes it's important to educate them before they leave your practice or have your MA, whoever is doing it, your nurse who's talking to the patients for them to know what to expect. So if a patient just start taking their medical cannabis and not having tachycardia and they had no idea that was happening, they might think they're having a heart attack. They might think that something is terribly wrong, not knowing what to expect. So always educate them and also let them know it's dose dependent. Because even though you encourage them a specific dose, a lot of patients don't follow that. A lot of patients might take more. Um, and then again here, those unintended side effects or the home use or the family members who are gonna use it, they're not gonna follow the instructions. They're just gonna take as many gummies as they can. So let them know that because if they take more, they're gonna have a, 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 I mean, more effects. So impairment while driving. So it is, a, it is a crime to be impaired, whether it's alcohol, whether it's other drugs or medical cannabis. So we have to let patients, if you have to go out, if you have to go to the grocery so be mindful of when you take your dose because you're still going to get in trouble if you are impaired driving. 
Other things is that we know there can be a risk of dependency, so also educate patients, or specifically teenagers or young adults, those risk factors are there. So the medical cannabis intention to focus on the medical condition that you are treating, because once a patient becomes dependent, they might start confounding, they might start coming up with other reason why they should continue to use, because they are dependent. So always. Uh, uh, be mindful of that as well. And then potential drug interactions. A lot of people don't consider their cannabis as a medication, so they may not tell you other things that they are taking, um, whether it's over the counter or other prescription. So have a good medication reconciliation. Have them tell you everything they are taking, including their over-the-counters, including if they are using recreational in addition to the medical marijuana. So ha that way you know what's on board, you can help them determine do they need to stop taking something else or what else can you do and give them the resources if they need it. If somebody has substance use disorder and they are taking medical cannabis and you notice that, okay, the patient is declining, okay, maybe it's time for them to get in some medical assisted treatment for their substance use before they can continue their cannabis, uh, medical cannabis. So always look at the individual, the patient, prescribe as needed. So also, um, really patient with a history of psychotic disorder, we mentioned if they have substance use, know those two can really make your patient decline, and they might blame the medical cannabis. The moment you give it to them, they start having cardiac arrhythmia, they start having new and sub symptoms, and some patients can really um, tell you that I was doing fine, and then I start taking this, and then I start having all those symptoms, but they just do not know what to expect. It's just patient education will be the key to take away from this talk. Uh, adverse effects, or again here, they are dose dependent. We know they can happen. And then always start low and go slow. So it's, it, that's the message here. We can always give them more. We can always increase it. But let's see how they're doing first, especially if it's a new patient. You don't, you, you, it's a new patient to your practice as well because it's not just a new patient to cannabis. It could be like you don't know everything about this patient yet. You're just getting to know each other. That's another reason why to start slow. And if the patient is demanding a larger dose or they really kind of try to pull your hand, it might be time to step back and say, okay, what's going on here? Why is this patient asking for more? And what's their, their true intention? So some public health concerns. This, this whole group here is about public health. So edibles is the main one that we worry the most about when it comes to a public health sense. As the healthcare educator at the Poison Control Center, I can tell you this is what we really want people to be aware of. Because they look good, they taste good, they look like what they use on a day-to-day -day basis, Patients, children, anybody else will be using a lot more of that. And then really, how can a child resist something that they know it's tasty and that looks good? It's colorful, um, they have other gummy bears, you've given them multiple times, so what's different about this? What can we do? Because telling the patient, a child don't touch something that looks good, is not gonna work. They're gonna climb on their friends, their siblings to get to what they need. And knowing that because the concentration, the potency is such a, a major concern here, one gummy bear may not be enough for a child. Most child is not going to stop at one. We've had children exposures where they ate the whole jar. So know that that can happen. People just did not expect the child to open it, and they opened it and got multiple. So the, the symptoms are really delayed, but then when they happen, they happen. So they can range from being having some lethargy to a heart, heart, I mean, heart rate, difficulty breathing, and then some confusion. And it can be as severe where the child has to be taken to the emergency room and be seen. And we've had um, new induced hallucination and really low blood pressure. And young children, we tell people, do not let them go to sleep. That's what a lot of parents think. They, I'm just going to let them sleep it off. It may not be the case. if they've if they've eaten a whole jar of edibles, they need some medical attention. So safety measures, I mean, it's not your job to police the homes. You are a physician, you've given the patients a medication, but what can we do responsibly to help promote safety? So we know people favor edibles, and children, they love things that 
taste sweet and, and that are colorful. So prevention, education is important. So at the point of dispensing, at the point of prescribing, I think we all have a responsibility to talk about it and not leave it down to the next person to do. So safe storage is the main way we can help prevent those exposures and know that people need to know what to do in case something happens. Even with the best practice, with the best storage, with the best home I mean, safety strategies, there will be some exposures. When it happens, what do they do? How do they respond? And then, of course, what resources are available in the community that can help patients and that can help families. So know that, tell people, medical cannabis is a medication. It's no different than your cardiac medication, than your metformin. It's no different than, your, than other medications that they are taking, the clonidine, whatever they are taking. So why are we dealing with something that can harm children and not let them know that they need to store them the same way? They don't share their whatever other medical conditions, the cardiac medications that they're taking. So it's not okay for that to happen. We've had I mean, patients sharing it with their spouse. You heard the call earlier that was a recreational use, but it was a family. I've, I was talking to some residents, some EM residents um, two days ago, and one of them told me I had a family of four. Mother, father, there are two sons. Cannabis exposure. Of course, it's recreational, not medical. But it's just to tell you that the average families, they are not all the same. They are using with their children. So we have to know to make patients more responsible for their actions. So they have to lock them up. What do I mean by that? Because a child, if they know something tastes good, they know, they know something, they've had gummy bears before, this looks like a gummy bear, they're gonna go to extreme measures to get it, and we underestimate them. They can move fast, they can climb, they can get to things that we can get to. So parents have to store them high up. The higher, the better. If you have to reach for it, that's the best way. So have your practice, whoever's doing your patient education, let them know you have to store this thing out of sight and out of reach. Not just on the top counter, not just on, underneath the sink. No, they have to put it out of sight and out of reach. That's the best way. For small children, if you have visitors, it could be as simple as putting their personal hook on the wall. That's not gonna work for the older kids, okay? That's just for the little children who are maybe one or two years old. Or have them, I mean, give them some cabinet locks. There might be something that maybe the dispensers can have if a family cannot afford to buy it, some low social economics, maybe giving them some things that they can take home with them, some medication lock bags. For teenagers, lock bags don't work. They cut them open, just to let you know. Lock boxes would be what you would give that family. So tell them, you're traveling, put your medical cannabis on a lock bag or a lock box. Take that with you. That's helping the patient having their medication with them. They live in Central Florida. They're going to the Keys for the weekend. Take it in something that's locked up. You're visiting family, do the same thing. So promote those safety measures. Let them know this is a medication. It's no different than other medications. So let's make sure that children can get to them. So and then again, if life happens, how do you respond? What do you do? We want to teach them when to call 911. So whenever they need someone to come on scene, it's still 911. But for anything else, it's the poison control number. Thank you so much for mentioning our number, which is 1-800-222-1222. We are 24-7. It's just let people know what to do. So I'll try to give you a quick spiel about the poison control center if you've never called us, if you don't know what we do. Just a quick overview. So just before we start, what is a poison is always the question. People think it's something in the jar, somebody's trying to harm you, your cousin who doesn't like you, you had a dispute with. That's not what it is. Any product, any substances, any chemical, anything can be a poison. We say the dose make the poison. So that's why I'm here talking in a medical cannabis conference about safety and it's from the poison control center. So water that we all drink, every day that's good for us. Too much too soon can lead to hyponatremia. So we always have to tell patients, you give them a medication that they need, the next person doesn't have that medical condition, they take it, that's a poisoning scenario. We have 55 poison control centers in the country, so wherever you are, wherever you practice, there is a poison control center for you. 
Not every state has one, but wherever you are, you're still covered. For example, if you are in Rhode Island, it's covered by Mass. If you are in, um, for example, Hawaii, it's covered by Colorado and so on. But in Florida, we are special. We have three because we are a large state. So I work for the one at the Tampa um, location at Tampa General Hospital. We were the first one that opened in 1982. Since then, we've had one in Jacksonville and one in Miami, but we work as a unit. Whenever you call the poison helpline, you are connected to one of us. If something happened, Miami can stay open, it's gonna go to us. If something happened, the whole state cannot stay open. A hurricane, for example, today is June 1st, Hurricane season starts, guess what? You can still get a poison control center that's gonna help you. So the poison helpline is for you as clinicians, but it's also for your patients. They call the same number that you would call to do a consult. And we have medical and clinical toxicologists available 24 seven. If they don't speak English, we have interpretation available. So it doesn't matter what time of the day they can get help. And did I say that it's all free? Because we are grant funded, they never have to pay for any services that they get from the Poison Control Center. So when they call or when you call, you will be talking to a clinician or doctors, nurses, or pharmacists, but they also have extensive toxicology training. And as I mentioned, we have clinical and, and, and medical toxicologists. No matter what time of the day they work, they're never gonna talk to an operator, they're talking to a clinician at 2 a.m. who can help them. So why would they call? We know that a lot of your patients, they're gonna use Dr. Google. Dr. Google does not know their past medical history. If you are close or they don't have a way to get um, to a helpline, tell them they can call the poison control center. We're not gonna get them in trouble. Parents, your children get, eat something. We're not keeping track of how much uh, often you call. Our sole purpose is to take care of that patient. And then again here, doing a call, what happened? We do a chart on every patient. Our calls are recorded. It's never gonna be your word against our word. It's always all documented. So when the clinicians tell what to do, that it's okay, you're passing that liability actually to the poison control center. In under two minutes, you should be able to get the, the help that you need. Um, really about 85% of the time, when someone calls us, whether they're at home, at the school, at the park, wherever they are, we can take care of them safely without having to send them to the emergency room. And um, sh I truly believe our EM physicians would love that because we are keeping people out of the ED who don't need to be there. So when we send them, they really need to be there. So we are providing timely diagnosis. We are identifying toxidrome, which is a group of symptoms that tells us those potential substances or group of substances. And then we are also giving treatment recommendations. And under two minutes, we do all that. Our whole goal is to really lower morbidity and mortality and decrease length of stay. So if a patient is in the hospital, a physician is calling us, our focus is to honing into the diagnosis, get them working in safely, working out alive the same way they come in. So we do other things. We do prevention and education. Um, we do clinical rotations um, for those who might still be in training. We work with pre-hospital personnel or EMS paramedics. We work with public health officials. So the goal is for us to remind people the Poison Control Center covers so many substances because anything can be a poison. It could be a snake bite, a spider bite, uh, a caterpillar, whatever it is, uh, a food poisoning, carbon monoxide. So we do everything and we can help you um, in all those ways. So we want you to understand how we fit into your puzzle. So we want you to save the poison help number if you never have it saved. It's easy because we say there are many poison, one number, it's 1-800-222-1222. And we have great educational materials. So let's say you wanted some educational materials for your practice to give to patients, whether they are a new patient, you're giving medical cannabis, or existing patients. Reach out to us, we'll send it to you for free. And when I say free, you don't even have to pay shipping, we send it to you. So our main goal is for patients to have the right tools, and then it's going to be available. So dispensary can use us. We can, a lot of them will reach out for magnets uh, for patients to have in their fridge, because remember, at the same way you are prescribing, you need to plan for what if. 
you need to plan that if they, the child get into it, what do they do? Or if they've taken too much, they have an adverse effects. Because we are a free public health service, it's okay to give them that information that they can, they're gonna be able to get help. So let me know if you need some educational material. And if something you look on our website, you don't see what you like, we can customize to you. If you feel like, okay, I'm looking for these specific guidelines, we'll get together and, and create a piece just for your practice. And then again here, you can use this QR code to order material, or you can send me an email, or we'll be able to assist you. Because we are grant funded, I just have a quick survey. Some of you can point out to it and answer. That's the only thing we require because we have to let the state know what we do and how we do it. So we are a free service again. We are your partner, the best friend you didn't know you needed. So let your patients know that they can call us if you need magnets so they have the number or have them save the number. When they sit with your MA, your nurse, you're giving it to them, tell them pull out their phone. Save the poison help number. You might need it one day so that way you know they're getting the right resource that they need. I'll be available for questions. We are on all social media. We are very active on LinkedIn for clinical, um, for healthcare professionals. So if you need to pick one, I would say that's a great one to pick. So I'm here for you if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duje. We're gonna move right along here. And our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Rosado. He's the president and CEO of International Medical Consultants. He's gonna to talk to us about exploring the therapeutic potential and medical benefits of over-the-counter phytocannabinoids. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. I know it's after lunch, but geez, come on. <laughs> You've had two speakers already. <laughs> All right. Uh... So, how many of you have not seen something like this or identical to this as you're driving through the streets of Florida? Yeah, pretty much everybody has seen something like this as you're driving around, right? Okay. So, for those of you who don't know me or have never heard me speak, this is what I've done from the age of 16 to present, and in 23 days, I'll be 62. So, I've got a few years of medical experience under my belt, starting from as a nurse's aide all the way down. And this is what I've done in the medical cannabis space since 2014 in the state of Florida. The other day, well, about three weeks ago, I was covering the Daytona office, and uh, I cover five offices for DocMJ. So I'm Gainesville, The Villages, help me out, Tracy, Orlando, Palm Coast, and Daytona Beach. Okay. So I'm in Daytona Beach, and a patient came in and said, what gives you the authority to recommend medical marijuana to me? And I'm like, damn, no one's ever asked me that question in eight years of doing this. Rothman, has anybody ever asked you that? Exactly. So I'm like, damn. So I'm thinking of all this. I'm like, no, no, wait a minute. Let me borrow from my parochial school nuns. So I answered a question with a question. And, the question, and I looked at her and I said, did you mean to ask me, am I a medical marijuana user? Her face lit up, her, she smiled, and I'm like, yeah, here's my card. Of course, I covered my pertinent information because I didn't need another stalker. But that gave her the credibility in her mind that because I was a medical cannabis user, I could recommend to her. Go figure. So, as my colleagues have already mentioned, synthetic cannabinoids, also known as K2 spice, is the second most commonly used illegal drug, number one being cannabis. But as someone said earlier, follow the money. The global industry for synthetic cannabinoids is 2.6 billion with a B back in 2022. So what we're gonna to cover today, HHC, Delta-8 THCO, Delta-9 THCO, THCP, Delta-10 and Delta-8 THC. A few of these have already been discussed, so I'll be glossing over them for the most part. So HHC, who has not heard of HHC? Okay, cool. So it was first synthesized from CBD in 1940 by a chemist by the name of Roger Ad uh, Adams. And what he did was he took CBD from hemp and hydrogenated it, added hydrogen bonds, hydrogen atoms. And by doing so, 
as you will see, where's, ah, there it is. You see that that double bond in the CBD is broken once adding the hydrogen atoms, and so it gives it two additional hydrogen atoms. And then, as a typical scientist, four years later, he did the same thing with THC. And you will see, again, right there at the delta 9, or the ninth carbon, by hydrogenating it, you add two hydrogen atoms to it. Now, what's the benefit of adding hydrogen atoms to this? It increases the shelf life, making it be able to sit on the stands for longer. It makes it more stable, and therefore, by making it more stable, it makes it more viable on the stand. It does uh, bind to the cannabinoid receptors. Now, what are the uses and potential benefits of this? Very similar to cannabis because it is a, it does come from hemp, uh, CBD from hemp. Pain management or relief, decreasing symptoms of anxiety, depression, reducing inflammation, increasing sleep quality, decreasing vomiting, and feelings of nausea. The one time I did this, HHC, um, I have a uh, old compression fracture of T12 from a severe auto accident in 1987, where I suffered partial paralysis and paresthesia. And every once in a while, I get a flare-up. And it was a weekend. I didn't have any medication in my home. And my recommendations were expired, so I couldn't go to. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> And my recommendations had expired, so I could not go to the dispensary on a weekend and take advantage of the senior, uh, <laughs> the senior Sunday specials or senior Saturday special. Nonetheless, I had been gifted some HHC. So I took a 25 milligram gummy, cut it in half, and I used it the way I use cannabis when I treat pain, which is I take an extra, an extra strength acetaminophen, similar to using it with oxycodone and hydrocodone, you add the acetaminophen because it potentiates the analgesia. Right, Dr. Newton? Thank you. <laughs> Pain management specialist always to my rescue. So I did that within an hour of taking 12 and a half milligrams and an extra strength acetaminophen, I began to drool. Watching TV, watching golf on, on the t TV, I started drooling. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I, I laid down. It was about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I woke up the next day at 7 a.m. So it did help my pain because I woke up pain-free and it increased my sleep quality because I woke up nice and rested. Do I recommend this? Do not try this at home. You did hear me say the one time I did this. Risks and side effects, very similar to Delta 9 THC, the greening out. Everybody knows what greening out is, correct? Okay, greening out is what these two ladies have been talking about, the tachycardia, the paranoia, the uh, dry mouth, the diaphoresis, hallucination, those are all behiled, and you call them, it's greening out when you use too high of a dose of THC, or you're a naive user, and you use something that you shouldn't be using, like eat an entire 10 milligram edible. And these are the references for the previous slides regarding HHC. So if you want to take a picture of it, you're free to do so. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Although you'll be getting, uh, I think you'll be getting the slides and the presentations from Gene. Where's Gene? Okay. Here. Okay, THCO. This is one I've never tried. Why? because as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Newton, it is THCO acetate. It is purely unadulterated synthetic, okay? Even though it does come from hemp, it is a synthetic product. And it comes from CBD, they add a bunch of chemicals to it and convert it into Delta-8 and Delta-9 THCO. The sellers and the people that promote it utilize the argument that, well, it comes from hemp, therefore, it's legal because it falls under the Farm Bill 2018. However, in February of 2023, the DEA has made it illegal across the United States, not just in the state of Florida, because, as I mentioned, it is 
synthetic. It is not found in nature. And for that reason, the DEA has banned it. THCP, this came to us by way of Italy. About five years ago, this is the article, I mean the, the research article that was published in 2019, and you'll see in the first line, a new phytocannabinoid with the same structure of delta-9 THC, but with seven-term alkyl side chain was identified. So what we're talking about is that. It's a seven-carbon tail chain. By adding that tail to the THC, it makes for a stronger binding to the CB1 receptor as much as 30 times more. Not only can they do it with THC, but they also do it with CBD. And so now they do a CBDP as well as a THCP. Now, what's the challenge with that? I mentioned it has a stronger affinity for the CB1 receptor because of the longer tail at the end. But in reality, less than 1% of the natural plant contains THCP. So how do you do it? You grab CBD, you doctor it up, and you make THCP. As I mentioned, it's 30 times more potent, so it heightens the sensation of everything. So if you do one joint, it's the equivalent of smoking 30 joints, one sitting. The one time I did this, <laughs> Notice the one time, one and done. The one time I did this, I became extremely paranoid. I mean, I went back to like my old Bronx days where I was sleeping with a, that night I went to sleep with a knife under my pillow because I was like freaking out somebody was going to break into my house because I did some THCP. No mas. Delta 10 THC. This is an isomeration. It made it, they make an isomer of delta-9 and convert it into delta-10. What's the difference? Right here, the double bond. This is the ninth carbon. You have a double bond at the ninth carbon in delta-9, and you have a double bond at the tenth carbon in delta-10. Spoiler alert, delta-8 means you got a double bond on the eighth carbon. Spoiler alert. So. It binds just the same on, uh, with the CB1 receptor um, as well as CB2 receptors. So it has a very, very similar function as delta-9 because it's an isomer of it. So the body kind of re recognizes it. Because it recognizes it, benefits are very similar to delta-9 THC. It has a neuroprotective property because it does elevate the acetylcholine, stimulating the mood. It increases energy levels as well as mood because it has a mild sativa-like sensation. So you get that sensation, that sativa high, that stimulation that you get from a sativa. Remember, indica in the couch, sativas stimulate. Pain and inflammation relief, again, it blocks the cytokine, uh, suppresses cytokine production and regulates pain. Again, remember that THC is 20 times more powerful than aspirin as an anti-inflammatory and twice as powerful as hydrocortisone as an anti-inflammatory. So it aids in that inflammatory process and again when taking it with acetaminophen it potentiates the effect. Uh, reduces stress and anxiety as I mentioned because it gives a sensation of upliftment and the same thing it boosts the mood because it has a sativa-like uh, scenario. Um, side effects, very similar to delta-9 because you're just converting the double bond from the ninth carbon to the tenth carbon. Delta-8, this is the granddaddy of them all because everybody and their mother is selling delta-8 THC, right? I mean, you can't go anywhere without seeing delta-8 sold here or they'll, they'll scam you, go THC sold here and then you go in and say, oh, it's delta-8. So. Same as delta-10, it is an isomer, as I mentioned earlier. The difference is a double bond at the eighth carbon rather than the ninth carbon. Other than that, same identical structure. How is it made? Again, you take CBD from hemp, you add lab-grade hydrochloric acid and toluene. 
Now, toluene, aside from being an aromatic hydrocarbon, it's used for what? Anybody know? Hmm? L uh, leather tanning, what else? Any painters or ex-painters in the room? Paint, paint and paint thinner. Any of the estheticians from across the way it snuck in here? Any ex nail polish in, uh, nail polish? Any ex estheticians in the room? Nail polish. It's used to make nail polish. That's what toluene is. Now, similar to CBN with THC, when you let the THC plant sit and you get oxygenated, it converts as it gets older that THC can convert to CBN. Also, when you decarboxylate it at a higher temperature, you get more of the CBN. With the hemp plant, if, sorry, with the hemp plant, if you let it sit and get oxygenated as it gets older, it can naturally convert to the delta-8 THC. However, it's in a minutia, it's a very, very small amount. Therefore, because it is in such a small amount, it's virtually impossible to be able to make the amount of money that it can generate. And so for that reason, they'll add the acid and the toluene. Again, it binds to the CB1 receptor, and the National Cancer Institute def has defined delta-8 uh, delta by stating that it binds to the G-protein-coupled receptor, CB1, located in the central nervous system. So they recognize that it has a strong affinity for the CB1 receptors. Now, what are the benefits? In 1975, they did a study with mice where they took uh, three doses, 50 milligrams per kilogram, 200 milligrams per kilogram, and 400 milligrams per kilogram, and injected it into mice that had tumors in their lungs. After 12 days, they found that 40 to 60 percent of the tumors had shrunk. They found that life expectancy increased by 23 percent, 25 percent, and 27 percent based uh, dose, re dose related. So the fifth, God damn it. Sorry, the bronc came out, I'm sorry. <laughs> the 50 milligrams increased lifespan by 23%, 25% to 200, and the 27% by 400. And then after 20 days consecutively, it reduced the primary tumor size. So it did cause, or they did find some antineoplastic activity. 20 years afterwards, they did a study, or someone that we know and respect and honor did a study on children. Anybody know who Rafael Mashulam is? In 1995, they did a study on children that were receiving chemotherapy. And they gave them Delta-8 two hours before chemotherapy and then every six hours for 24 hours following chemotherapy, and all nausea was abated. No nausea was found in these individuals. And so after 480 treatments done by Rafi. This was the only study I could find that was done on a human. Dr. Block, do you know of any other studies done on humans with, CB, with Delta-8? Now, Delta-8 as an ad, uh, increasing appetite, this was done in 1990, I'm sorry, 2004. They discovered that by adding, again, with mice, by adding uh, Delta-8 to mice, it increased their appetite by 16%. And so they found that by adding, potentially by using Delta-8, it could stimulate appetite, so help people with wasting syndrome, uh, anorexia, secondary to chemotherapy, et cetera. Pain and inflammation. In 2018, they did a study using topical Delta-8, topically for individuals, uh, mice that had had uh, a corneal lesion. And so they applied that and they found that it addressed their pain as well as the inflammation. Um, one of our MMTCs used to sell Delta-8 a few years ago. Um, I used to recommend it to patients that had cancer. Together with the RSO, I would always recommend the Delta-8 based on what Dr. Mishulam had done. Um, but then out of the clear blue, they no longer, they stopped selling it, and I don't know what happened or why they stopped. So maybe this weekend I'll find out why. 
Again, side effects of Delta-8, very similar to Delta-9, Delta-10, greening out. Tachycardia, hypertension, anxiety, dizziness, vomiting, hallucinations, discoordination, memory loss, delayed reaction time, loss of consciousness, and death. Now, we were talking about poison control, and so here in 2022, this was retrieved from the FDA website. According to the National Poison Control Center, 2,362 Delta-8 THC exposures occurred between January 1, 2021 and February 28, 2022. Of those exposures, 40% were unintentional. 82% were pediatric. Of the 40%, 82 were pediatric. 8% required admission for a critical care unit. Unfortunately, one of those cases coded and died. Yeah, go ahead, Barry, go ahead. I see you, I see you, go ahead. <laughs> well, I shared, I shared this with one of my best friends who's um, a pediatrician, practices in Ocala, and as we were talking about my presentation for today and this specific slide, He's like, well, I'm surprised you didn't ask me how many children or adolescents die from opiate toxicities. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I didn't think about that. So he sends me this article that was published in the JAMA Network Open December 7th of 2018 entitled U.S. National Trends in Pediatric Deaths from Prescription and Illicit Opioids 1999 to 2016, what was found? Nearly 9,000 children and adolescents died from opiate toxicity with a threefold increase in mortality. Now, are there, are there any rain men or rain women in the audience that could calculate 17 years into the 9,000? 529 per year versus one. Now, I'm not advocating the use of Delta-8 THC. Let's just put things into perspective. Wouldn't we all agree? So, the hierarchy of highs, technically THCP is much higher than THC. We discussed that earlier because of the extension of the tail. Nonetheless, eliminating THCP, we've got THC, HHC is next. Delta-8 THC is about medium. Um, some people will say that it's THC light. In my practice, I have found, because when patients come into the office, aside from asking them what they use and how much they use and how experienced they are so I can determine where in the Barry Gordon doobie scale they fit into, I also ask them, how, if you're buying over-the-counter stuff, and how's that making you feel? And I have found that individuals with an XX chromosome tend to have a greater, and a, great, a greater adverse reaction with Delta-8 than those with an XY. Why am I using this? Because I have some transgender patients, and regardless of what they're doing in their, trans, in their transitioning, they're still XX, XY, and I found that Individuals with XY are, they say it's a little bit lighter than doing straight THC, whereas XX hate it. They say that the effect is much stronger, much, much more aggressive. So now let's get political because we know we're going to get political. We have to get political. We live in Florida, right? So according to the National Law Review, published March 21st this year, the Florida legislature passed Senate Bill 1698, where it prohibits the sale of synthetic, any synthetic cannabinoids or Delta-8 THC or Delta-10 THC or HHC or THCO or THCP or THCV. Not only does the bill contain that, but also it limits the amount that can be sold to five milligrams per serving or the whole packet, no more than 50 milligrams. 
So put simply, if this passes by the signature of Uncle Ron, then all these will be illegal. Now, two days ago, an article was published in uh, South Florida, Miami specifically, where it's rumored that Ron DeSantis is going to veto this bill. Now, there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of thoughts. Something that came up in the article was that the hemp industry in the state of Florida is a $10 billion industry. And what do politicians need more than anything? Money, funding for their campaign. So he's not going to piss off an industry that's $10 billion strong. I have a theory. Stay, stay with me, and I'll show you why. Now, one of the greatest individuals that I've ever met in the cannabis space who has dedicated pretty much his entire life to the study of cannabis, Dr. Greg Gerderman, uh, a proud native of the state of Florida, was interviewed four years ago. And he was a fortune teller because back then, and I'll read it, I don't like to read slides, but I don't want to misquote him. Um, in short, Delta-8 is a synthetic drug. You can presently go into any strip mall vape shop and find this drug. Some manufacturers even sell hemp flour sprayed with Delta-8, calling it Delta-8 flour. Consumers think it's the same as Delta-9, but legal. I'm also a medical review officer, and every day I hear Somebody say, oh, no, I bought it over the counter. I bought it in a vape shop. It's legal. Yeah, but it has THC, and you pee dirty. You're going to lose your job, especially if you're CDL or have a DOT. In my view, it is unequivocally illegal. Right or wrong, Delta-8 is listed as a Schedule One substance. The legal interpretation frequently referenced is a clause in the Farm Bill, not at all intended to legalize something that gets you high. A chemist could theoretically make PCP out of CBD as a starting material, but that doesn't make it legal. Tell us how you really feel. So apparently the feds got a hold of Dr. Gerderman's interview, and this is why I think DeSantis is possibly going to veto that bill. Because at the federal level, the Farm Bill expired September 2023, and there's an amendment on table. Yeah, who's that? They're going to prohibit um, anything that does not include hemp derived products containing cannabinoids. That means if it doesn't come from the plant, the cannabis sativa L, it's considered illegal. If it was synthesized or manufactured outside the plant, it's going to be illegal. If it has similar effects or marketed to have similar effects on humans or animals as THC, it would be illegal. So in short, it would render Delta-8, HHC, THCA products illegal. Why THCA? Because when you combust THCA, what does it become? THC. You take it to 220 degrees Fahrenheit, you just converted THCA to THC. Correct. Correct. Be well, no, because this is sold over the counter. This is what they're talking about, over the counter stuff. Because you can go to an over the counter um, chronic guru, to mention one here in the state of Florida. And you can get THCA flour, and you can buy that over the counter. Yeah. Hit uh, THCA near me, and you'll see. You can buy it over the counter. Because I see patients pretty frequently that buy this over the counter. No, THC acid, THCA. Yes, sir. So if anyone has any questions, we're going to have a question and answer here shortly. Here are all my contact uh, numbers, my platforms. So if any of you needs to get a hold of me or wants to get a hold of me, you can reach me on any one of these. And if you can't, I'm either in prison or dead. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Rosado. We're going to end our session today with Dr. David Berger, who's the owner of Holistic Relief, and he's going to talk to us about dosing and route of administration considerations when using medical cannabis in adult and pediatric population. Hello, everybody. It's good to see a lot of people here. I met a couple of pediatricians already. Is right? Who here is a pediatrician? Just anybody else besides? Okay. Oh, the people that I met already. Okay. It's nice to have comfort with pediatricians. Huh? No, I don't need a step stool. I'm actually, I'm, I'm bending down. Actually, I'm actually six foot three. Um, yeah. Um, so I have been a holistic pediatrician. Um, I was actually using herbs in my clinic at Tampa General Hospital during my residency back in the mid-90s with the department's permission. And so I had to come up with individualized dosing protocols using all types of variety of supplements and herbs, taking a low, slow, observe kind of motion. And so when cannabis came available to us as providers, recognizing that most doctors, especially most pediatricians, were pretty freaked out about it. For me, it was just another herb that I could figure out because, you know, I didn't know about it personally, but also um, learning how to do the self-titration. So it really, I believe, gave me a little bit of a step up. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things in the way I've approached things through the year. Um, and uh, you'll see all my dosing regimens and everything else that's here as well. Are we using the green button here? Go on with the top, the green one, this one here. Oh, okay, not the one that looks like a little, not the one that looks like a, a pot plant. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. So, um, of course, we've been hearing all along about the, um, about the different types of cannabinoids, and most people have heard about the CBD and the THC, and of course, one being intoxicating, um, and one does not have intoxicating effects on it. Um, I've also learned a lot about other cannabinoids, which I'll get into a little bit as well. Um, so you hear about these terms, the minor cannabinoids, minor mostly because it's, um, there's a small amount of it in the various, whether it's hemp derived um, hemp plants or, or marijuana plants, um, but of course they can be isolated as well as if you heard synthesized in order to get there. And typically as you'd hear about, you know, CBG, we didn't really talk about CBDA and that's actually the, uh, um, CBGA, excuse me, that's like the mother cannabinoid that it's made by both hemp as well as marijuana plants that, as you may know, they're both cannabis sativa plants. So every plant is a sativa, even though we talk about sativa and indigo, um, like some substances. Um, but it's the mother one that's made, and then all other cannabinoids are derived from this. Um, CBG, you've heard a, a, a lot more here, and more than I've ever heard at a conference before, which is becoming one of my favorite cannabinoids, um, especially for anxiety, irritability, depression. Um, I have a lot of patients who either didn't do well on CBD or who did not... Um, show any benefit from CBD, who are really, really doing well with CBG now. And uh, I, I'm excited that, that this is becoming more and more known about because it's really, I work with a lot of kids with autism especially, and uh, man, it's been really making a big difference for a lot of my patients. Um, CBN, which we've also talked about, I have been taking it for about five years now. It is the best thing I've ever done for sleep. It has just been keeping me through the night, being able to, uh, if I, you know, now that I'm in my mid-50s, wake up to pee and then go back to bed, but I can fall back asleep now. Um, and it's been consistent. I haven't had to increase the dose since as I, as I worked it up, but uh, it's really been, I, I tell people as much as I like my THC, CB, um, CBN is the thing that's bringing me the most health benefit because I'm able to sleep and I'm able to be awake and attentive during my day. Um, the THCA, which we heard about also, does not have intoxicating properties. So, you know, as you heard when we heat it up, that's one thing, but like in the raw plant, it's THCA is not intoxicating. So a lot of the reason why you'll hear about people wanting to be able to juice and to get the raw plant to be able to grow their, grow their own is not necessarily so that they can dry it out and smoke it, but people want to be able to use it. And, you know, if you're, if you're juicing it, you may need to do a lot of it. And the three and a half ounces, let alone five ounces in that period, you know, you could potentially go through that through a week if you're trying to, uh, if you're, if you're trying to juice it. So again, um, but that's what a lot of people use for and uh, talked a little bit about THCV, um, and it, but a lot of people don't realize that it's an it's an appetite um, um, suppressant. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of people who get the munchies, you know, it's certainly, you know, certainly late at night, it wouldn't be impossible for a bag of tortilla chips to disappear in my household. Um, but at the same time, um, THCV has like, um, and uh, there used to be a couple strains out there and it's getting harder to find. And hopefully as things move forward, especially with the, um, with the way that the laws are moving, that we'll have more access to plants identified as having high THCV um, qualities to it. Now, you probably, I think, I, I didn't make it here yesterday, but probably saw something similar to this 
the um, main thing being is that's, oh, that was not what I meant to do. Um, that's what I meant to do. So that in the middle where you see that CBGA, and you can kind of see how the CBGA goes to CBCA, DA, or THCA, and then it kind of gets broken down. You can see how the THCA becomes a delta 9, comes around to the CBN. So, you know, CBN is when what happens when THC gets stale. So I kind of jokingly say if you found a baggie in your sock drawer that maybe was there since high school, it probably it's got CBN in it by this point. Um, okay, and then you can also see how there's also um, some of the metabolism, biosynthesis of, synthesis of the terpenes that we've been hearing a lot about as well. Okay, so again, as I was saying, you heard indigo in the couch. Um, sativa is more stimulating. That's how I've always kind of thought of it. But also about one in five people will tell me the exact opposite happens, but they'll say, well, I'm glad you told me that that happened because it happened to me and I just switched it around and, and I was fine. But as I said, there really, there are almost no pure sativa or indigo plants out there. Almost everything is a hybrid. Um, if it's sativa enough, they're calling it sativas, but almost everything out there really is a hybrid. So, you know, I kind of thinking of it as like when you talk to, at the dispensaries and you have hybrids, so there may be like more of a sativa to sativa leaning in um, um, hybrid to a pure up hybrid, etc. But really, it's still semantics and it's going to be different, you know, um, even amongst particular strains. You know, my one of my favorite strains, um, which I can't find much anymore, um, and I said to my best friend, uh, that she's like, I absolutely hate that strain. That's the worst strain I've ever used. We both have anxiety. And uh, he said, what do you like? I told him what I like. He's like, that's the worst strain I've ever tried. I'm like, it's my best strain. You know, we went back and forth on this. And so, you know, anybody who like looks it up and says, this is the best strain for this, or this is the best strain for that, you know, you really, there's a trial and error aspect, which is why one of the things that I guide patients, parents on especially, is keeping a really good log, a really good spreadsheet, what you gave, how much of it, and on a scale of one to five for sleep, for irritability, anxiety, whatever the symptoms are, and track it. Every time that you make a change, track it. Maybe you find out, hey, I think I was doing better three weeks ago. I don't know about you, but if I had made five changes in the last three weeks, there's no chance on earth I would remember what I was doing three weeks ago with all of that unless I wrote it down. So that's a super important thing, especially when you're initiating care with somebody, is to make sure that they're able to document as such, because then you can kind of see what goes wrong. And then the, my other really important pearl is make one change at a time. Okay, that's true also when people are trying to get off their other medications. It's like, don't make two changes because if you're increasing one while you're decreasing the other, you have no idea what just pharmacologically happened in your body if you're making two changes at the same time. So always make one change, whether you're increasing, whether you're adding in a second product, whether you're decreasing. You know, I tell people, although, of course, the effects for the most part of cannabis are going to be felt the first time out, Maybe you had a good day or a bad day. Give yourself three or four days to observe your child, to observe how you're doing, keep that going, and then, but usually most people, with the exception, as we heard, about how anti-inflammatory effects kind of build up a little bit more, so that instant feeling, you know, if, you, if you're feeling better 30 minutes after you just inhaled something, it's not because you completely changed around your inflammatory system. Okay, I mean, there's, so, so that's going to take time, just like the first time that you take a steroid, you know, it's you know, start to help, right? But there's a reason why we do typically um, prednisone or a, we, we do a dose pack in order to, and then we wean people off is you kind of need a little workings into that. And hopefully when research becomes available that we're now hopefully seeing in the schedule three now that we'll be able to research a lot more of that. Okay. So, oops, not that's the wrong button. There we go. Okay. So as you may know, um, originally there was a, uh, a CBD um, product that was specifically um, allowed by the FDA um, for um, certain genetic um, disorders for associated with epilepsy, um, um, Lennox Gasto and Dravet syndrome. And so that is what the formal approval of that medication um, was for. Um, it was an isolate. You know, it's obviously still available. It is sweetened with sucralose. I'm one, as a holistic um, physician, um, prefer to avoid natural, I mean, um, artificial sweeteners when possible. Um, but uh, that's what it is there. But interestingly, and this is kind of like what kind of also keyed me on into like what we can really do safety-wise with CBD, is because as you can, um, you can see, starting doses of 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per day um, and working up to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. Okay, so if you're talking about a 45-pound kid, 20 kilos, you could be giving them 400 milligrams of CBD a day. I mean, has anybody here actually, you know, who typically don't do that, you know, and, 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 the, and they say that the maximum amount is, a, um, again, so you could be having astronomical amounts. My take home message is that means that they think that this is safe to be the kind of dosings that we're using. 
okay? Um, but of course, because, unless you do have one of those conditions or can get a pre-authorization, you can be spending 32 grand a year on that. So of course, that's why most people will go to us and to, and to be talking about other types of things because you won't be spending that much money in a dispensary. Um, I hope not anyway. Nothing personal against the dispensaries here, but yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, that's a, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the FDA recommendation. There's no recommendation from the FDA that says to do so. Yeah. Okay, so if you do, I just put this up there. I know you'll get it in the packet, but there, and, uh, if you do want to, there's actually a really nice document that's the entire history of pediatric cannabis um, um, and use, so you can kind of um, go to that. You, you'll be able to see that, but just a, a nice article that I came across that I kind of geeked out about a few years ago, so it's kind of cool. Okay, so we've been talking about over-the-counter products, okay? And of course, incredibly buyer beware because of all types of things. Um, lack of information on it, um, you know, first of all, I, and I still see it where it'll say like hemp parts, 25 milligrams of hemp parts. What does that mean? Is that stems? Is it seeds? Is it leaf? Is it actual that? So, you know, always if you're looking for a product, make, and again, this won't be an issue with the dispensaries, okay? But make sure that when it says 25 milligrams, and it's actually 25 milligrams of, that will say CBD on it, for instance, and not just hemp parts, because they're, they're still doing that, or proprietary blend. I don't know about you, a lot of supplements will say proprietary blends. I'm like, well, what am, what am I giving you? I don't know. It's a proprietary blend. Well, I'm like, if the company won't tell you what, you're, what they're giving you, maybe you want to look at something else, but I'm not a big fan of proprietary blends overall. Um, and again, well, I won't talk a little about that, um, but again, as we know in Florida, we've now had this formal description of less than 0.3% um, THC is what's considered... Um, is what's considered allowed. And that's kind of like where you see those like five milligram gummies like at these hemp, uh, at these smoke shops. Let's face it, if it's less than 0.3%, but you make a really big gummy, you could probably load 100 milligrams of THC. And if you make a gummy this big, you know, so um, so, it, so part of that is actually really knowing what it is. And, and as you may know, they, they all have to have like a QR code on it, but all those over-the-counter products have to say is how much THC in it. They don't have to say what pesticides are in there. That doesn't have to say what kind of uh, mold and, and other types of heavy metals or things that are in there that thankfully, you know, are within our regulatory system. We're checking that. They're publishing that. That's super important. I recommend that for my herbal products that are not cannabis related. You need to know what is going into your body. You need to know what's going into your child's body. Um, so um, we've seen, you may have seen some of these um, that um, these purity testings where you can see where um, both they'll talk about the potency where the individual types of cannabinoids um, over it'll have a terpene profile as well. Now this particular one just up top lists heavy metals past and some of those mycotoxins. Um, you know they'll some of them will go a lot more detail into that, which would I prefer. I'm not one who just loves to see pass and fail. I like to see what they're actually testing for because if they're testing a panel of 10 and it passes is different than if it has a panel of 40 pesticides. And it, and it passes. But again, you can just see all the different terpenes that they can potentially do. This company does did actually test for all the different types of pesticides. I, I won't read them all to you. Um, but you can see there's a lot of things that are out there that people are, that a good quality company should be testing for. Okay. Now, in terms of routes of administration, we've heard about some of this already. Um, the most important thing is, you know, I always thought, thought it was kind of funny because, you know, there's edibles, there's sublinguals and there's orals, and those are the three th different options. And I'm thinking to myself, where else would you put an edible if it wasn't oral? You know, I don't know why we have this differentiation between the three sublingual. I mean, if, I guess if you're putting it somewhere else, I don't want to know. But, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's not all oral. I just, I get a chuckle whenever I'm talking to patients about that one. Um, but, what, you know, so when you hold it under your tongue, though, and it is sublingual, Okay, it, it avoids that first pass effect through the liver. Okay, and it's in that liver where the 9 delta THC gets converted to 11 hydroxy THC, which is more intoxicating. So the issue is like you probably, you know, if you ever knew of anybody who overdid it, it's almost always with an edible or a tincture or something like that, almost never inhaling it. Okay, it's because of that first pass effect through the liver. So when you swallow it, it all gets make that conversion to the 11 hydroxy THC at once, as opposed to when you avoid the liver first pass, it kind of gets to everywhere and then eventually comes to the liver, but it's more over time broken down to as opposed to like all get taken there all at once. Um, you know, I, I do like use a lot of tinctures in my practice because how precise you can be with the measurement and I always really um, explain to patients, make sure that you're understanding how many milligrams. Don't go by drops, droppers, because you could have this company could have 10 milligrams per ml, this one could have 20 milligrams. So if you told me you took a dropper full, I don't know, you could have taken a lot or a little and I don't know. So always think milligrams and of course that's how we think as, uh, as providers, but uh, they don't. 
right? They just think of, oh, I had a gummy. And I tell them, it's like, you need to know that because like, if you told me you take two Tylenol, did you take two extra strength or two regular? That's almost twice as much. Not quite, but, you know, so milligrams is really what we need to be having those conversations about. Um, the issue that I have with a lot of capsules, especially with children, is that they're not small enough milligram-wise to just give them a capsule, even if they can swallow, because I would never start a kid on 10 milligrams of oral THC. I want to start one or two, you know, but I did learn early on that especially if they're the oil-based capsules and you freeze them, you can cut them in half and it'll stay frozen. You can put the other half back in to keep it frozen. So that you, as long as they swallow right away, you don't want it sitting around because then it'll melt out. But if you swallow it frozen, and actually probably a little bit of a delayed onset too because it has to melt once it gets inside of you. So, but you can, uh, I did find success that you can cut um, capsules in half. Now, you can't really cut it into a quarter probably, but you can take it into, into half. Okay, and of course, suckers and lozenges, the oral absorption, again, kind of getting more of that um, type of, of avoidance of the uh, first pack. And again, once you swallow baked goods, gummies, whatever it is, so I mean, I'm not a much of a gummy fan, but when I do, I'll kind of keep it in my mouth and I just let it dissolve there. I kind of chew it a little bit and like hold it under my tongue because I don't like that delayed um, effect and what it can do. I did have a rough experience once with a brownie that I ate and then an uh, it was a cookie that I ate and then uh, about 70 minutes later I wasn't feeling anything and I took another one and then five minutes later the first one kicked in and then an hour later when the second one kicked in and let's just say I don't remember much about the third Lord of the Rings. Um. Okay, so there are nasal sprays, um, fast acting, okay, and, and you know that can be really helpful especially if somebody's having a seizure. Right, um, you know, because you, you kind of, you can, as long as you can hit the hole there. Um, suppositories, which will um, um, work faster than oral. Um, I have heard, and again, they're hard to find, but I have heard women who have used it for cramps and used it vaginally. I, I actually had one parent, uh, one uh, woman who said to me, it's interesting, when I use it, my, my uterus feels high, but I don't. Um, and so uh, uh, implying that it was quite an aphrodisiac for her as well. I'm like, oh, that's good to know. Thanks a lot. I'll make sure I tell that to the mom of my next four-year-old boy. Um, but, uh, um, you know, obviously skins we've heard about in, you know, whether it's topical, whether it's transdermal, of course, um, the pharmacokinetics um, are going to be, um, and dynamics are going to be important here because how much is being absorbed versus how much is staying local. So you kind of have to know about that as well. And we've heard about patches. You know, there are some that are 72-hour release, some that are um, 20 milligrams um, that are an eight-hour release. So again, make sure that you educate that because obviously if one's releasing three times as long, or no, oh, that's much longer than that actually, nine times as long um, to, uh, for the same um, um, 20 milligram being released, you kind of have to know about that. Okay, and of course, um, in pediatrics, of course, we're not allowed to do any of the flower, obviously, in an adult, so we can, but pediatric lecture here. Um, we heard about the, um, the issue with the vitamin A acetate, and I kind of just want to, because you, if you remember, like the summer before COVID, that's when vape lung injuries was at its biggest thing. You know, we have determined a little bit before that, that especially in some of the jewels and the popcorn lung, it was due to the flavorings itself, the artificial flavorings that were causing the problem. And, you know, but to find, then when we found out that the dealers were, and the manufacturers on, on the black market were cutting it, because vitamin A, um, E acetate has, can have the same chemical, I'm not the same, the same quality, same color, thickness as cannabis oil and so that's what they were doing is they were cutting it and, and obviously people have been putting vitamin E oil into their bodies and onto their skins but no one ever uh, you know heated up and, and inhaled it before and that's what's causing what we saw those x-rays that we saw before and of course you'll hear about these different types of um, of concentrates etc um, I have personally been recommending if people are going to be vaping, I, I really do prefer live rosin. For those who don't know, it's a solventless um, form of doing it. The, um, basically, you can imagine take, they, they, where they take the buds, they freeze it, and then imagine kind of like a giant panini press with like a cheesecloth on the bottom. So the heat and the pressure just causes the oil to ooze out. Completely chemical free, maintains high terpenes, and the, all you have is the pure oil. So that's kind of in my way. That, to me, that's the closest way of just of, of getting it to what the mother plant started off with, if in the, besides using it as the mother plant. Okay, so the, on, the, on, the left, on the right hand side there, that's the nasal spray. You know, we will also see these concentrates that are in the oils and such like that. You know, one of the funny things, and, and scary funny, you know, you'll hear people say a grain of rice, right? Well, are you out there measuring how much grains of rice, actually, how long that is? Because maybe if it's an extra millimeter, that could be 20% more, right? So, and, and not just, so I just always thought that was kind of like an interesting way of measuring things out by a grain of rice. So I just kind of giggled on that one. Um, okay, and of course, we've seen vape cartridges and such like that. Um, you know, some of them, as you may know, just the sheer act of inhaling will... Um, will activate and come in other times. You have to push a button like you do see on the right, on the, uh, right there. Um, now, dry herb vaping. 
Okay, to me, because as a physician, I don't encourage anybody to burn anything into their lungs. But for those who don't know, dry herb vaping is when you grind it up, and then you put it into different types of machines, and it basically heats it up to a temperature where the active ingredients, the terpenes, the cannabinoids are released, but at a lower temperature than the plant actually burns. So it goes in green, it comes out like brownish, like broiled almost looking, but there's no ash. It does take longer to go through the same amount in order to, to extract the active ingredients, but it's a way of, again, using the, 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 the natural plant in a way they can get all of the chemicals in without burning it. So I do think that this is also the best way of using, the, the safest way, I should say, of using the, uh, the flower itself. Okay, and, if, and there are, there is, um, you, one also can get a meter dose inhaler, and as you know, especially with the spacer, if you don't use the spacer, most of it hits the back of your throat, I think 70%, even if you're an experienced asthmatic, um, in fact, but with a mask and a seal on, and again, even if it's a, um, since I deal with some very aggressive or irritable kids, as long as the seal is on their face, they have to breathe, so they're going to get the dose. Right? Obviously, if somebody's having a seizure, they're still breathing. You can use this as a rescue medicine as well, and of course, oral um, inhaled absorption very quick. Okay, different patches, and you can see that there are different ones that even have different ratio patches along the way. Um, but in terms of how do I introduce cannabinoids? Now, I do also see a lot of patients in my practice, um, it's interesting, pediatrics and then very old people seem to be <laughs> drawn to me, and so I treat them kind of the same way. I'm gonna treat a, uh, um, a geriatric patient and dosing-wise very similar, if they've never used it before, very similar to the way I do a pediatric practice. But uh, you know, typically with kids, we'll start with oral tinctures. Um, I'll typically suggest starting the first dose in the morning just to have kind of the day to see how that goes. I don't think the first day that you're doing it, you need to give multiple doses. Let's see how long it's gonna last. Let's see how, the, how long the kid's going to last, um, do well with afterwards. And then, as I said, you know, I typically talk about doing things three times a day once they kind of work up to it. Some people may need it twice a day. Some people may only need it once because they sleep fine. Some people have to take it for bedtime because it's the only way they can sleep. Um, and again, waiting a few days before making a change that we see um, and just kind of self-titration. So to me, much of what I do as a physician is also empowerment. Empower the parent, empower the patient. Give them the education that they need. Make yourself available so if something's not going right, that they can hit you up. I mean, you know, I, I get hit up a few times a week on a question, how often do I get hit up with something that stumps me? Like, never, but I want them to know you can, if we have to talk two, three times a week until you get this going, let me know. So I tell every patient, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume you have this right, okay? You're allowed to ask any question you want. We don't charge for questions in our practice. We'll see you every seven months, but we're here for you if you need us. Now, some people do request like a med management appointment because they really sometimes even want me to go shopping with them online. So we'll pull up a dispensary and we'll, on my Zoom, I'll share the screen with them. And I'm like, oh, you may want to look at this. I may look at that. But I don't typically start off with that because there's too much variability with from person to person as to how that's going to go. Okay, so in terms of strategies, very sensitive um, people um, of, of, of adults, you know, two to three milligrams, um, I'm sorry, for CBD, um, again, two to three, I'll typically start kids off at five milligrams per dose, make increments of five milligram jumps. With teens and adults, I'll typically start at 10 milligrams and make 10 milligram jumps. If it's a 50 milligram per dropper and it's marked off in quarter mLs, I'll 12.5 instead of 10, just I don't expect them to figure out what a four-fifths of, of uh, 0.25 mLs is, but uh, so that's kind of how I kind of, a little bit my range there. Okay, um, now I mentioned in terms of um, for sleeping, but even how you take it could depend on how your sleep pattern is. If your issue is falling asleep, taking it an hour before bedtime can help, help you fall asleep. But if your issue is more staying asleep, wait until the last moment before you go to bed because it's sticking in the body longer the, um, relative to when you took it. And I typically will start anybody off at about five milligrams as a starting point, going up to 40, 50 milligrams. I haven't really seen anybody need much more than that. Um, and then the CBG, as we were talking about before, again, um, you know, take, you know, again, waiting a few days um, to make a change. Um, also, if, the, if it's interfering with sleep, obviously sometimes people will have that problem. And so again, times, timing of the day can make a difference. But again, typically with the CBG, I'll start with five milligrams, making five milligram jumps up to 50 milligrams. And that's per dose when you need it. And as I said, you know, a lot of people are like, well, once I fall asleep, I'm fine, so I don't need it during the day. But man, my anxiety is something I need to hit up for as soon as I get out of bed. So uh, yeah. 
Wrong button again. There we go. Okay. So in my population, especially in pediatrics, I don't, I strongly encourage people, don't bring in THC unless you've tried these other things. Okay. Especially with the kids, brains are developing until at least 22 years of age. Um, and, it's, you know, I, I treat very young people because I work with kids with autism. I work with kids with seizures and with, and, and cancer. The youngest patient that I've treated is 18 months. You know, so again, I don't want to have to use THC now. She's, do, <laughs> she's doing absolutely amazing now. I just saw her. She's a uh, nine years old now and just the leukemic patient and it's just like oh my god I mean this kid was not in good shape when I first met her and she was my I think my first um patient Barry knows who it is um and we worked the first patient together and uh but Lily's doing fantastic by the way Barry oh my god it's it's just so it's so amazing and her and her parents are just so sharp too um, yeah, so, but another thing, especially in the pediatric world, because, and I know it, it was on the slide, but CBD can, can counteract the intoxicating effects of THC. So what I also suggest is when you bring the CBD in, don't stop it to bring the THC in. Keep the CBD going and then bring the THC in slowly because you'll probably be able to, to tolerate and get the benefits without the intoxicating effects or the loopy effects of THC as long as the CBD. Now, so basically, once you bring the, CB, the THC in and things are good, you can maybe start to lower the CBD. Oh, nope, I need to bring it back to here. I only have a couple more minutes, so let me just kind of going through this. But as I said, oh, I, I have people who have inhaled CBD and use it as an antidote for an overdose. I, I actually did see it, so that happened once. And the um, only time I ever broke the law in sharing it with somebody is there's a, a friend that I had a CBD vape pen, and, I, and her partner um, asked me to come over because she was kind of comatose and not responsive. But she was smiling when I got there, you know. Um, and uh, sure, I, she was able to breathe. I took, she took a, a few hits off the CBD vape pen a few minutes later, and like 10 minutes later, she opened up her eyes. And she's like, hey, David, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, I've been here for a while, actually. And, uh, and then, uh, but yeah, so, so I've seen that happen with my own two eyes. Okay, so in the THC dosings, you know, in young children, no more than one milligram um, as a starting point. Older kids, teens, maybe starting at two milligrams in the same kind of jumps. Adults, I'll typically start at five milligrams, unless it's an older person or somebody who is chemically sensitive or somebody who said that they've had bad experiences in the past. Then I'll go back to my baby doses. Okay, you've heard of, may have heard of microdosing. This is a small amount that's taken frequently throughout the day. Not enough that will make a person intoxicated, but maybe a drop or two every, every hour. The patches, by definition, become a, a microdosing, um, continual dosing as well. Okay, so as I said before, I don't go by particular strains, especially since each dispensary has to grow their own and make their own. So, you know, good luck with that. But I really talk mostly about terpenes. I educate about terpenes. Um, you may have seen this before. This is from, um, from Leafly, um, the terpene wheel um, that talks about the different um, types of, um, of terpenes and what their different effects are. So I do a lot of education on, on terpenes and uh, explain how that goes. But even still, there's going to be some variability. I mean, like, why is it that some kids do well with Ritalin and some kids do better with Adderall, even though they're both stimulant medications? But, you know, same. SSRIs, et cetera. So there's still going to be variability, but I kind of use this as a key when we're searching for, you know, to use these types of guides. So when you go into a dispensary, you can say, can I please see which, di which tincture has the most limonene in it or the best linalool in it, et cetera. So, and that's something that they can pull up by the percentages. Okay, I'll skip that. Um, I also do drug interaction checking. I've actually created um, where I've gone through every single pharmaceutical and with their CYP, and so I've countercrossed that with all of the um, with all, with all of the cannabinoids, the CBD and the THC, so I can provide that information for them. Um, and that is it. And I finished with only 49 seconds over. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Berger. We have, uh, we have time for a few questions for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. I like the last two speakers in that. Uh, well, Dr. Rosado asked if I was more familiar with Delta-8 studies. I like the last two speakers in that. Well, Dr. Rosado asked if I was more familiar with Delta-8 studies and then follow it up with Dr. Berger and kids. The, the one comment, I guess, it's not a direct question, but I invite you to comment on this, is that study that Dr. Rosado was citing, which was a Mishulam study from 1995, was looking at nausea and vomiting in kids. And as parents, you'll know that you watch kids, you know they've got cancer, and you're watching your kids miserable and throwing up, going through all that experience. It's traumatic to parents, let alone to the kids. 
thing I wanted to comment, um, even though I didn't have other studies, was about that particular study. It involved 480 samplings. That study was not completed. And it wasn't completed because the findings were so dramatic that the double blinding wasn't needed. Any of the people involved with it knew right away uh, after a few hundred. Uh, so they didn't even have to finish. It was studied, it was completed prematurely from the design, but the results were that dramatic. And so that, that was my comment on it rather than other studies. Of course, we don't have, that was from 1995. And we do know much more now about Delta 9 and nausea and vomiting and its relief of it as well. So for evidence-based data, yeah, it's skewed towards Delta 9, but that particular study was notably dramatic, and Professor Mishulam commented on it. He says, we didn't need to keep doing it. We were, we, in a humane way, couldn't keep giving the control study a placebo when we knew that this would help that many kids. Any other questions? Yeah, I just want to get a clarification because of my griping, I was sent the case of the four-year-old. It was out of Virginia. It was a 114-pound four-year-old with some degree of congenital heart disease as well. And, and the reason that that autopsy included the Delta-8, it was included in a, in a, in a, in a parental uh, um, case of you know, uh, neglect and things of that nature. So it was very unclear. And, and it was uh, estimated um, 10, what was it, Renee? How many Delta eights? Whatever it was, but it, it, it was it was a very morbidly obese four-year-old. So it, it's still very confusing to me. The one thing, comment I wanted to make, Joe, and 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 I love your talk. I always do. I think we're just talking about Delta ten, and you talk about the sativa type effects of Delta ten. I'll be honest with you. I think you're falling into that rabbit hole a little bit that I've also seen in their marketing literature. Because to me, that should that should be a terpene effect anyway to a certain extent, you know? And, and I've seen that Delta-8 is supposed to be more sedating and Delta-10 is supposed to be more energizing. I'll be honest with you, I find that all that to be marketing hooey, quite frankly. And um, I don't know, um, to me it'll be really interesting to see, as I've been telling everybody, if I have a head that rotated all the way 360 with the governor um, and his stance on, on the hemp bill right now, I'd be doing a poltergeist right now. Um, I don't get it. Um, what we all want here is safe, regulated products to hit the shelves of Florida. I was in a meeting with Holly Bell five years ago, and I don't know if Jody's in here. There are other people there. What we all wanted at that time was a state-centered lab to do all the testing on those extraneous cannabinoid products. That's all. If you want to sell a Delta-8 product, then make sure it is Delta-8 and make sure there are no contaminants in there, right? If it's a hemp-derived Delta-9, make sure that's what it is. And that may add a 10% increase in cost at the wholesale level or the retail level, but I don't care. Anything that hits the shelves in Florida that's a cannabinoid should be state tested. And, and, and that to me is just an issue that, that, can, be, that can be handled at that legislative level, and, and, and then you get rid of that, uh, of a lot of the controversy over who can sell, who can't. Let's just all make sure that it's safe and appropriately tested. That, that's my point. There's a question up front. For the first two speakers, um, one of the slide caught my eye. You had a list of top 15 exposures for the poison control. Many different types of cannabinoids were there, but surprisingly, not a single opioid. There was benzodiazepine that was topping. topping. So what happened is, are we out of opioid epidemics, or is that <laughs> opioid exposure is directly called 911 rather than calling the poison center? No, not hardly. So the way it's organized, organized per county, and there is a separate area for opioids, and underneath that is drug use. So it's categorized out of the big picture because it is so much. And within the opioid breakdown, they have various opioids. And correct me if I'm wrong. So if you go to the live site, you can do drug, um, drugs and then you can do opiates. And then you can put in the year that you want, 22, 23, 21, whatever year you want. And then it'll populate that information for that. So opioids is its own separate category outside of the drug because there is so many that are listed. So there was a top 15 
drugs under the drug abuse category for the Florida Poison Control Center. And I'll hand this to you. Donna? Exactly. You? And as she mentioned, opioid is so much, it's an epidemic, so we have a, our own category. So our data, what you're looking at, always speak volumes. So if you're looking at substances of abuse, specifically not opioids, including, then that's going to be the top 15. So if we had to flip it, as you can imagine, opioid would have been um, the most common one. And as a matter of fact, for young children, acetaminophen is most common, if, if you think of it like that. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So it's really what you're looking at. Darn it, you disappointed me because being a pain management physician, I was thinking, oh, we are out of the opioid epidemic now. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Tomorrow. <laughs> what percentage, um, Dr. Berger, of the 880,000 medical patients are children? Or is children under 18 or under 21? It would be considered under 18 because they're allowed to get flower at uh, F F 18. Yeah, but I, I don't know what the percentage is. Yeah, Interesting sorry. we don't have that data because there are... Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm imagining OMU has it. Exactly. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have it. There's a big push to, to find pediatrics, uh, pediatricians who recommend uh, CBD and, and THC. So I, I get that question all the time. So I was just wondering, like, oh, in the big picture, what percentage of that pool is for you guys? Yeah, I know it's not very large. In, in my practice, obviously, it is because of the self-selection bias of who comes to see me. Um, but that's why it's nice to know that we're seeing other pediatricians who are... Uh, who are stepping up and who are learning about this stuff? Because let's face it, you want to—if you have a kid, you probably want to see a pediatrician. I get it. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion because we read all the time that there have been no deaths from cannabis therapy, but I'm hearing now that you you can die from a cannabinoid because but there were no endocannabinoid receptors in the brainstem. So it's interesting that I see respiratory depression and death from a cannabinoid. How do you explain that? Oh, it's very interesting because no one has ever died, so to speak, from cannabis therapy because we have no endocannabinoid receptors in the brainstem. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these products, especially the synthetic products, they have a lot of other components in them that not, might not be tested. For example, acetone, and um, you mentioned earlier about you know the paint thinner for the nails. But acetone is another product that you often see when you're getting into these synthetic components. Even though they're starting out as cannabinoids, you can have residual components that's not being tested, and acetone is just one of those examples. We're going to go ahead and go to break now. I encourage you to come up and ask individual questions to our panel. I'd like to thank the panel for uh, an excellent session.